Hello students, welcome to F8, which is Audit and Assurance module. And in this module, we'll be talking about audit procedures. And my name is Ali Shirer Kaboyev, and I, I work for Swansea, as well as I teach um, at Huanghua University as well. <coughs> I just want to introduce this module before we go on with chapter one. In terms of the lectures, let me just give you the lectures first. In terms of the lectures, we will have nine lectures and the last lecture will be revision and preparation for exam. Uh, in our lectures, we'll be talking about from introduction to assurance, introduction to auditing, we talk about the corporate governance and professional ethics, and we will also discuss planning and risk assessments, also audit planning and documentations. How are we going to uh, record our audit, audit evidence and um, what is internal control and the difference between internal control and um, test of control. And also we will, we will discuss audit procedures and sampling as well as uh, finally reporting um, our findings. As for the assessments, we will have two time constraint in class tests. Each test will be 50 minutes and each test will weigh 15%, total of 30% of your total mark. Uh, in class tests, we will have multiple choice questions and some short essay questions. At the end of the, the module, you will have two hours of exam and which will weigh 60% of your total mark. Also, your tutor will give you 10%. That's it, uh, for your attendance and your um, participation in your seminar and lecture classes. Okay, uh, let's talk about the first chapter. first chapter is about audit and other assurance engagements. In this lecture, our learning objective will be we will discuss the purpose of external audit engagements and we also discuss what is accountability and the stewardship and agency, the agent and agency problem. And we will also discuss types of assurance services. We will divide the assurance services into groups and we will also discuss assurance and reports. So if I ask you a question, what's the objective of external audit of financial statements? So why do we need external auditors to come in and give their opinions about financial statements? So that's a question to you. Why do we need external auditors? The objective of an audit of financial statements is to enable the auditor to express an opinion on whether the financial statements are prepared in all material respects in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. So in this one, an audit of financial statements is an example of an assurance engagement. The purpose of an external audit is to enable auditors to give an opinion on the financial statements, while an audit might produce byproduct such as advice to directors, oops, uh, advice to directors on, on how to run the business. Its objective is solely to report to the shareholders or the, to the users. Basically, we're talking about the shareholders. So we have mentioned assurance. So I have a question for you. What is assurance? How do you define assurance? What do you understand when I say assurance? Assurance engagement is in which the practitioner expresses a practitioner meaning the auditor 
expresses a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users about the outcome of the evaluation or the measurement of a subject matter against criteria. We will define all of them. Who is the practitioner? What's the subject matter? And what's the criteria? So we'll come back later on and we explain, explain all of those three terms. So giving assurance means that offering an opinion about the specific information to the users of that information that that information um, are able to make the confident decisions about that the users uh, of that information are able to make uh, a confident decisions knowing that the risk of that information being incorrect is reduced so it is type of some sort of confidence giving information to the users Again, why do we need assurance of external audit? Because we have separation of ownership and the management. So the owners are the shareholders. And they somehow, they do not run the companies. We are talking about the big companies where the owners and the separation of the ownership and the management. So the managers run the company, owners do not run the company. Shareholders, they invested money, but they do not run the company. So we have separation of ownership and management. What happens when separation happens between the ownership and the management? Then there is information asymmetry. That leads that being owners of the company, they need some sort of assurance that their managers are working on behalf of the shareholders. So they want to know whether their investments are safe or not, because they have invested huge money into this company. And they want to know whether their investments are safe whether the managers are working on their behalf or not. So what happens? The managers run the company. At the end of the year, they prepare the financial statements for the auditors to check. And these auditors are appointed by the owners, shareholders, to check whether the directors are working in accordance with their interests. When auditors come in and check the financial reporting, uh, financial statements at the end of the year, year-end financial statements, they give some sort of assurance and they give independent opinion on the set of financial statements. That information, that assurance engagement goes out to the shareholders. And that audit is for the shareholders only. Because when shareholders see that audit report being, let's say, unmodified report, positive report, then they are happy with the management. If they get negative feedback or negative assurance, then shareholders have a choice of sacking the management and bringing somebody else to run the company. I will explain in the next slide in a diagram how the system works. So we have a company and that company is run by directors. And who appoint the directors? The shareholders appoint the directors. Who own the company? The shareholders own the company. And directors run the company. So as you can see, the shareholders, they own the company, but they don't have time. Somehow they don't have time, or maybe they have no knowledge of how to run the company. They have some money, but they don't have time, or they don't have knowledge to run the company. So what do they do? They appoint directors to run the company on their behalf. So the directors manage the company. At the end of the year, directors prepare financial statements year-end financial statements. 
and we want to make sure as a shareholder that financial statements are correct. So we want to measure the financial statements. We want to check the financial statements, whether they, these financial statements are correct or not. So what we do, we appoint auditors as a shareholder. We appoint independent auditors to check the financial statements. While the auditors check these financial statements, and then they come back to us, they give us a report. And that report gives us a, some sort of confidence, some sort of credibility to the financial statements. Because if it's a positive, then shareholders are happy with the management. If it's negative, then the shareholders are not happy with the directors and they may replace directors. So we have mentioned that external audit and external audit are divided into two. So in most companies, uh, that when we do the external audit, we are usually doing statutory external audit. And we divide them into two, statutory and non-statutory. And I will explain them in the, in the, in the next, next slides, the difference between the two. So we know in most countries, the audit are required under the national statute for many undertakings. And obviously the small companies are exempt from um, external audit. But we are talking about the big corporations, big companies. So it is by law, they must go through external audit. So the other organizations and entities require a statutory audit may include charities, investment businesses, trade unions. In the UK, for example, under registered companies legislation by the Companies Act 2006, most companies are required to have an audit, except the small companies. The statutory audit. What is this? A statutory audit can bring different advantages to the company and shareholders. The key benefit to the shareholders is that the impartial view provided by the auditors. However, the company also benefits from professional accountants reviewing the accounts and the system as a part of the audit. So advantages might include recommendations being made in relation to accounting and control systems and the possibility that auditors might detect fraud and error. So the statutory is required by the Companies Act 2006 and that's, that's compulsory for the big companies but there are some exemptions. The small companies can be exempt from needing an audit um, if they meet two out of three of those conditions. So their revenue is less than 10.2 million and the statement of financial position is value, value of the statement of financial position is less than 5.1 million and if they have less than 50 employees. So these are, we're talking about the small companies. But if you have, uh, let's say, revenue of more than 10.2 million, then obviously you're not exempt from statutory audit. And the second type is non-statutory. Non-statutory audit, audits are performed by the independent auditors because the company's owners, uh, members, maybe trustees or professional or, and governing bodies or other interested parties want them. So it's not a compulsory thing. So if those people, if those um, um, people they want an audit, then they will do a non-statutory audit. So what's the result? In the result, the auditing may extend to every type of undertaking which produces accounts, including clubs, charities. Some these may require statutory audits as well. Some sole traders and partnerships. 
Some of these organizations do not operate for profit, and this has a specific impact on the nature of their audit, and also the audit of uh, non-for-profit organizations will be considered in more detail in, in the later chapters, maybe chapter 17 we, we might touch a little bit. So again, uh, for non-statutory audit, is performed by independent auditors because companies owners want it, maybe members want it, or maybe trustees want it, maybe professional or governing bodies want it. So if they want it, then they will do a non-statutory audit. As I mentioned, the statutory audit is required by, according to the uh, Companies Act 2006, so the old directors of non-exempt companies to prepare annually financial statements. They prepare balance sheet, profit and loss accounts, and then balance sheet is, is giving a true and fair view, and we will explain what true and fair view is. And also, when we talk about the profit and loss accounts, showing the true and fair view of the company's profit for the financial year, again, according to the Companies Act, um, requires the auditors to report on these financial statements. Who are the, the users or stakeholders or the users for this audit? And we are talking about the users of the financial statements. Who uses the financial statements? Who has some interest in it? Obviously the first one is shareholders and the shareholders run and own the company sometimes or maybe the shareholders own the company but they do not run the company so in this case we have separation of ownership and the management so directors run the company shareholders own the company and there's a separation between the ownership and the management so in reality according to the agency theory that directors are accountable to the shareholders and they are stewardship they are stewards of shareholders because they are running the company on behalf of the shareholders so the first one is the shareholders and the second one is the directors. Directors also want to uh, want to see the performance of the company so they can make uh, decisions. And also the employees, they need to know about the, their company that they are working for several reasons. Job security is the first one. Because if they are working in the company, if the company is bankrupt, then obviously they will lose their pensions, they will lose their earnings. So they want to know the performance of the company or the position of the company. So they are also interested in company's financial statements. In terms of the banks, so banks or the companies who loan money to the company are also interested in the financial statements of the company. Why? Because they have loaned money and they are interested in the company's performance. Why? If the performance goes down, there's a chance of the company not able to pay their money back. Another one is publics, public or customers. The customers who buy from this company, they also want to know. And also the suppliers as well. Suppliers want to know the performance in the position of the company. And then the lastly is the government organizations. They are interested because if the company makes profit, then they will calculate the tax liabilities and they will get money from the company. And the second one, second reason why government organizations are interested in the company is that for statistical purposes when they publish their statistics then they will need those information 
and we have mentioned the stewardship. What is a stewardship? Stewardship refers to the duties and obligations of a person who manages another person's property. Here, directors are stewards. What's their um, duty? Their duty and obligations uh, to manage the, the company on behalf of shareholders. So their duties of a person who manages the company on behalf of shareholders. And also they have to report back to the shareholders. How do they do it? By publishing the financial statements at the end of the year. And that financial report, financial statements are prepared by the directors and checked by the auditors. Auditors has, have been appointed by the shareholders. Then, obviously, the financial statements are more credible. More we can trust to the financial statements. And also, we have mentioned about accountability. So what does accountability mean? Accountability is the quality or state of being accountable. That's being said that being required or expected to justify actions or, and decisions. It suggests an obligation or willingness to accept responsibility for one's actions. So that is the definition of accountability. Here, directors are accountable to the shareholders and the shareholders are the owners of the company. So the directors being stewards, working on behalf of the shareholders, they are accountable to the shareholders. And you might, uh, you might, you might ask, what are the directors accountable for? So they are accountable because it's important to understand the answer to this question is directors are accountable for the shareholders' investment and the shareholders have bought the shares in the company. They have invested huge money into the company, so they expect a return from, the in, from their investment. As the directors manage the company, they are in a position to affect the, that return because of information asymmetry. So the shareholders, they invested huge money. They want to see, they, want, they, they expect two things. They want dividends from the company. If the company makes a profit, they will get the dividends. And second one is a capital growth. When they buy shares or when they invest money, then obviously share prices will go up if the, if the company is profitable. From there, they will make a capital growth, capital returns, capital gains. So they want to, they want to expect two things. Okay, so in here we are talking about accountable being um, able able to justify actions and decisions, and they have obligation to accept the responsibility for their actions, and also directors need to protect and grow the shareholders' investment, as I mentioned. And shareholders invested huge money, and they expect two things from from their investments: capital growth, capital gains, and dividends. So. They communicate the position and performance of any possible future issues. So the directors need to communicate. The position means the statement of financial position. Performance is income statement. <laughs> or any possible possible future issues. So we will talk about the corporate governance in the later chapters. And also we have mentioned assurance services. <coughs> Many of the requirements in relation to corporate governance necessitate, necessitate uh, communication between the directors and the shareholders. As we discussed in an earlier slide, directors of all companies are usually required to produce financial statements annually, which give a true and fair view of the affairs of the company and its profit and loss for that period. So they are encouraged to communicate with shareholders on matters relating to directors' pay and benefits. Um, this is required by law 
and also that going concerns and management management of risks. But how will shareholders know whether directors' communications are accurate? Okay, I repeat the question. How will the shareholders know whether the directors' communications are accurate? How do they know that the information that came out, because the directors prepare the financial statements at the end of the year, how do they know that the information that came out from directors and that communication is accurate? Can shareholders trust the information from the directors? Obviously, there is a risk of mistrust by the shareholders. That's why what they do, they appoint external auditors. Shareholders gain assurance of how company is doing from external party from the auditors. Once they hear from external auditors that that's a positive feedback or the assurance, let's say positive assurance, from the auditors, then they will trust the financial information that came out from directors. And we are talking about audit is an assurance engagement. So we are talking about audit and assurance. So that, that the module that we are learning, F8 of ACCA paper, is about the audit and assurance. An audit is an assurance engagement. An assurance engagement is the one in which a practitioner aims to obtain sufficient information, sufficient appropriate evidence in order to express a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party about the outcome of the measurement or the evaluation of underlying subject matter against criteria. So we have mentioned uh, so many terms in here. So we have mentioned the practitioner and we have also mentioned about intended users and we have also mentioned um, degree of confidence in the subject matter and subject criteria. So these elements, these terms need to be discussed basically. An assurance engagement is the one that a practitioner means the auditor express a conclusion. He gives the um, uh, auditor gives um, their opinion, they express their opinion, a uh, conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the internal intended users. Intended users are, we're talking about the shareholders, about the outcome of the evaluation or the measurement of a subject matter is the financial statements against cri relevant criteria against the rules and regulations or the framework. Five elements of assurance engagement. An assurance engagement performed by the practitioner will consist of the following five elements. The first one is a three-party relationships. What's that? The three party are intended users, responsible party, and the practitioner, or the practitioner, intended users, and responsible party. What do, what do we mean? I already mentioned that. Practitioner means the reviewer of the subject matter, uh, auditor. Intended users are the shareholders. Responsible party, responsible for preparing the financial statements, directors. The second one is the subject matter. This is the data to be evaluated that has been prepared by the responsible party. Who are the responsible party again? The directors who are responsible to publish, to make, to publish their financial statements. So subject matter, is, this is the data to be evaluated that has been prepared by the responsible party. It can take many forms, including financial performance of the company, uh, non-financial um, in performance such as the uh, key performance indicators and also the process such as uh, such as internal control and behavior um, and behavior means the compliance with the, the laws and regulations 
And then the third one is a suitable criteria. Suitable criteria is the subject matter is evaluated or measured against the criteria in order to reach an opinion. So we are talking about criteria is law. So they compare against the law. The fourth one is evidence. Sufficient appropriate evidence. Sufficient appropriate evidence needs to be gathered to support the required level of assurance. Before they give their opinion, the auditors need sufficient appropriate evidence so they can give their conclusion, they can give their opinion. Without gathering sufficient appropriate evidence, they cannot give their opinion. Or the, the level of assurance, they cannot give the level of assurance. And last one is assurance report. A written report containing the practitioner's opinion, practitioner's means auditor's opinion, is issued to the intended users, to the intended users means shareholders, in the form of appropriate to a reasonable assurance engagement or limited assurance engagement. So they will have one of the two opinions. One in their report, either they will give reasonable assurance or they will have limited assurance. And we will discuss this in the later slides. What does an assurance engagement need? Uh, you can use the mnemonic of CREST. C stands for criteria to measure against the law uh, and accounting standards. The report means the report is written in a suitable form that is um, international accounting uh, international standard on auditing requires the audit report uh, in a uh, is in a written report issued in a prescribed form and they have evidence evidence means that they need to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence to support the audit opinion and the subject matter we mentioned that the financial statements and a three party involvement involvement or three party relationships uh then we mentioned that the users and the shareholders we are talking about directors being the responsible party who prepare the financial statements and the audit firm is a practitioner and hope you remember that slide. What are the benefits of audit assurance to shareholders and other users? So why we are interested in in audit reports? So in terms of the audit report assurance that we get from the audit report, benefits of assurance report is that it increases the credibility of the information for decision makers. Okay, so when we see the audit report, it increases the credibility of the information for us to make our decisions. Then we can trust that financial statements. It decreases the risk of management bias or any errors or any fraud in the financial statements because it's been checked. It's been compared to the original invoices. It's been checked by the auditors and that decreases the, the risk. <coughs> the third one is possibility, possible draw attention um, to any information or deficiencies in the financial statements. If auditors find any information, then they will put in their notes, in their statements, in their reports such as any deficiencies or abnormalities and that will also point pointed out in the report so we are aware of it and also gives the investors added um, confidence and faith in the market so a lot of investors they want to invest in the company so they will look at the audit report and that will give them the, the credibility and also the so they have a trust in in that information so they can buy the shares of the companies. The lastly, a review of accounting system and uh, process and recommended control. These are all benefits of 
the uh, assurance, audit assurance. Why? Because they auditors, they already reviewed accounting systems and the process, how it's going to be um, run, <clears throat> and also the recommendation, uh, they give recommendation how to control the efficiency of the, the systems. I've, I've mentioned the two types of assurance engagement. <laughs> According to assurance service include a range of assignments from external audit to review engagements. <clears throat> As we discussed in the previous slide, that auditors the audit can be used to give assurance to different different uh, stakeholders on many issues. And however, an audit is an exercise uh, designed to give high level of assurance and involves a high degree of testing and therefore high level of cost as well. In some cases, stakeholders may find that they receive sufficient assurance about the, about an issue from less detailed engagement, for example, a review. A review can provide cost-efficient alternative to audit where an audit is not required by law and will provide limited assurance. The objective of a review engagement is to obtain the limited assurance about whether the subject matter information is free from material misstatements. As for the internal audit, it provides an independent assurance service to the board audit committee and management focusing on reviewing the effectiveness of the governance, risk management and the control process that management has put into place. So mention that external audit can be either review engagement or the internal audit. So we have divided them into two. <coughs> The assurance engagement, review engagement objective is, as I mentioned in the previous slide, it's a cost-effective alternative where the audit is not required by law, uh, where less assurance is required by the people who want review engagement. To enable the auditor to state whether on the basis of procedures which do not provide all evidence that that would require the audit. So they mentioned that anything has to come to the auditor's attention that causes the auditors believe that financial statements are not prepared in all material aspects in accordance with the inter identified financial reporting structure. This is the, the statement they will put into their review engagement. Uh, there are two types of assurance engagements, <coughs> attestation engagement and direct engagement. What are the differences between the two? The main difference between the two lies in who is measuring or evaluating the underlying subject matter against the criteria. So in attestation engagement, this is where the underlying subject matter has been measured or evaluated by the practitioner. Practitioner means the auditor. And the practitioner concludes whether or not the subject matter information is free from material misstatements. If we're going to give an example, a good example of attestation engagement is review of sustainability report, which has been prepared by management. In that case, the management measures and evaluates the extent to which company has achieved its sustainability targets, and the practitioner provides a conclusion as to whether the measurements, uh, measurement and evaluation is free, free from material misstatements. As for the direct engagement, this is where the underlying subject matter has been measured and evaluated by the practitioner and the practitioner then presents conclusion on the reported outcome in an in, in assurance report. If we give an uh, example for that example, uh, that is when the practitioner is engaged to carry out review of the effectiveness of the company's system of internal controls. <coughs> Uh, and also then they issue an assurance report explaining the outcome of their reviews. Assurance engagement uh, in terms of the audits, internal auditing. What's the, the, mm, the point of internal audit? As I mentioned, explained li a little bit earlier on. It provides an independent assurance service to the board 
so it is internal audit so it only reports back to the management or the board and also audit committee and management focusing on reviewing the effectiveness of the, the governance uh, risk management control process that management has put into place so it's just uh, uh, they provide independent assurance services to the board audit committee and management <coughs> Internal auditors can also carry out the review engagements for the management for the orga foreign or organization. Exam examples for this is a value for money reviews, internal um, audit, uh, the financial audit, uh, operational audit, uh, procurement, uh, procurement audit as well. <coughs> uh, internal auditors are employed as a part of organization's system of control. The responsibilities are to determined by the management and may be wide ranging. So they have different um, responsibilities, and that responsibilities are determined by the management. So uh, internal audit function performance, assurance, and consulting activities designed to evaluate and improve the effectiveness of the entity's governance, risk management, internal control process, and they will report back to the board, audit committee, and the management. <coughs> so in terms of the level of assurance, we have different assurance engagements will provide a different level of assurance. And different assurance engagements will provide a different level of uh, assurance. Assurance can be reasonable, positive form, or uh, positive, positive form of conclusion, or limited, or negative form of conclusion. So reasonable assurance engagements provide a higher level of assurance than the limited assurance engagements. Assurance obtained from an assurance engagement can never be absolute. Uh, assurance here means that auditor's satisfaction as the reliability of the assertion made by the party for the use by another party. And directors prepare the financial statements for the benefits of members. They assert that the financial statements give true and fair view. Uh, the auditors provide assurance on that assertion. To provide such assertion <coughs> assurance, the auditors must uh, assess the risk, plan audit procedures, conduct audit procedures, assess the results, express an opinion, and finally then the degree of satisfaction achieved. And then, therefore, the level of assurance which may be provided is determined by the nature and uh, nature of the procedures performed and the rules and the results. Another type of assurance engagement where the, uh, where the lower level of assurance is given is a review engagement. And we will talk about uh, after we come back from our break. Let's take a break because uh, I'm not sure how long it's been. Um, let me check the time. So we have 43 minutes. Let's come back after 10 minutes and then we do the second part of our lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs> 